very warm welcome to this opening of the exhibition Ron Arad, Yes to the Uncommon at the Vitra Shaudipo. Who invented then, the name? Sorry? Who invented this name? It was Hung. Hey! <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, really happy to have Ron Arad here with us tonight, as you can hear, and please give him a very warm welcome. I, I'll be super brief because we will have a short speech outside after Ron's talk. The only thing I want to say is that um, the reason for us to do this exhibition was that we have many of Ron Arad's pieces in our museum's collection. A lot of very early pieces that are connected to the history of the Vitra Design Museum, to the history of Vitra, but also to Ron's history as a designer. And I think some of them are quite crucial in the evolution of his career. Um, and uh, I think we'll hear something from Ron about some of these pieces. Um, what I want to say is that Ron Arad uh, studied um, sculpture at the Bezalel uh, Art Academy in, in you Jerusalem. You can say that, but it's not true, but it's okay. It's, no? Well, that's what some people write, but... Okay, uh, there's um, fake news. Then you should correct that. <laughs> um, it's alternative facts. Okay. I studied at Bezalel and then I studied at... Bezalel and the Architectural that's... Association in London, and then there was the one-off studio and um, other works in the 1990s, and Ron will say more about this now. Yeah. Um, okay. And uh, what I just wanted to mention is that there is a really long collection to, a connection to Ron as a designer from the Vitra Design Museum because he was involved in um, discussions about the museum even before the museum opened. So um, he knows us and a lot of staff members since many, many years. And I'm really happy that we have him again here tonight after a very early exhibition at the Vitra Design Museum in 1990, which was devoted to Ron's work. And um, I think it's a nice circle that we can close today, and I'm really looking forward to hearing more about this from Ron. So we're closing the circle, that's the last time. <laughs> <laughs> you should open it again. Okay. And after that talk, and now I let Ron speak because he's uh, very impatient, as you can see. <laughs> um, please join us all for drinks on the square in front of the Shao Depot afterwards, and we will have a, a machine outside that Ron will activate. And um, yeah, you should press the button, and uh, you will see what the machine can do. Wish you a very nice evening. Thank you. Okay. Um, any any questions? <laughs> I'm serious. Any questions? Yes. You said yes. Not yet. Ah, not yet. Uh, I'm very excited to be here. Uh, and when I think back, Vitra really had a big uh, things to blame in my career. Um, it is maybe, maybe I do what I do partly because of Vitra. To be more precise, Rolf, Rolf Elbaum. You all know Rolf, he's sitting there and he's going to wave. <laughs> Um, I, before I knew I was a designer, I read an article about the man who loves chairs at, in Blueprint magazine. Blue, Blue, Blueprint was a new magazine when I started having a studio, not exactly knowing what I'm going to do. But there was a picture of, um, of this rover chair. Yeah, of this, um, and Rolf says, Ron Arad is one of the most interesting designers to come from London. Am I a designer? I didn't know I'm a designer. <laughs> and I didn't do this, I mean, this, I did this chair when I tried to have an honest attempt to work. I, st I graduated from architecture, then I tried to work for another, for an architect. This is what you do when you graduate. And it didn't take me very long to find out that I'm not cut to work for other people. It's very difficult to work for other people and it's more difficult to do it after lunch. <laughs> so, 
so one lunchtime, I didn't, I didn't uh, come back to the studio. I went to, where is it? I'll find it. I went to a uh, scrapyard. This is, by the way, fake news because this is not the scrap. I wish this was the scrapyard. I went to, this is in Switzerland, actually. But I love this picture. I went to something that didn't look as glorious as, glorious as this, but like this. And I went to fulfill my idea to make a piece of domestic furniture out of a car seat. Because I thought, uh, is this music planned? <laughs> um, I thought they're, they're throwing lots and lots of, of very invested ergonomic uh, luxury seats. And I uh, thought, why don't we... I was recycling, but I wasn't recycling. I thought my reference point was more to do with uh, find objects like Marcel Duchamp or like Picasso's Toro, which is a bicycle seat and a handlebar. I, didn't, I, thought, I thought more of ready-made and objet trouvé more than I thought of... of, uh, of uh, this is the first time I see it. I didn't think of Trouvé. I thought of Trouvé. <laughs> and this is, uh, and uh, I didn't know that, uh, that Trouvé copied me before I was born. <laughs> and, uh, and later, after I did this, I mean, I sort of made more and more aware of the similarity to the, uh, to the Prouvé chair that, by the way, no one I know have seen. There's only one photography that appears. Have you seen it, Rolf? No. But you know it, you know the one I'm talking about. I asked Prouvé's daughter, she's never, no one has seen it. There's one 45 degrees photograph of it. Anyway, he copied me before I was born. <laughs> and uh, I, uh, I had this studio and um, I didn't know what was, what I'm going to do in the studio and I did this uh, chair about say a year before this photograph and the door of the studio was a found object it was a bus door and uh, the, I, had, I made the two chairs two red chairs the first ones that I found and I thought all chairs are red all the but I didn't know that they're very rare, and later I learned that in auctions, there are three times as much as a black one. But uh, they were there on the floor for a year, no one took any interest of them. Until one day around Christmas, uh, I was there, it was closed, Covent Garden, where the studio was, was closed. And someone knocked on the door, and I said, sorry, uh, I'm we are closed, he decided in the French exit, but I want to buy this chair. Oh, we're open, come in. <laughs> and uh, he bought, this guy bought six chairs and he paid, you want to know how much? 99 pounds per chair. A lot of money. But... And then Caroline, who's sitting here, saw the check after Christmas and said, Oh, Jean Prouvé, eh, Jean Prouvé. Jean Paul Gautier bought a bought a chair. Who's Jean-Paul Gaultier? <laughs> in 81, I don't think he knew exactly who Gaultier was, but he used to come to London to, to look at street fashion and, and uh, use it in his way. Anyway, later we will, I learned that uh, we were born on the same date and we designed this shop in London, but that was uh, after that, not because of that, because it was a private thing, he didn't put it in his shops, I don't know, it was for his private home. It became a hit by, uh, by our standard. Um, other things I was doing those days uh, was what I could do. This is uh, a concrete stereo, um, which was uh, making a concrete, well, making a stereo system out of concrete and pebble, and I, I, by, I thought that 
by chiseling the concrete and exposing the, pebble, the pebbles and the electronic components, I'm making a beautiful object like jewelry. But the interpretation of people was different. The French people called it ruinism. <laughs> and uh, post-Holocaust uh, post, uh, design and Beirut style. And, and I thought, I'm really genuinely thinking I'm making an ob objects of beauty. But that misinterpretation was really paid. Because when they did an exhibition at the uh, Centre Pompidou called Les Nouvelles Tendances, they wanted to invite people of, of different genres uh, to celebrate the 10th anniversary of the Pompidou Centre. And, um, and I was, I, they wanted, someone had, they had the bright idea to have a ruinist in the, <laughs> Thing. So that's why they invited me. I was the youngest, uh, the youngest exhibitor in this exhibition. The theme of the exhibition was uh, uh, the habitation of the future. And I thought, I, I'm not going to do any, any retro-futurism. I'm not interested in that. But if you want the future to come faster, uh, let's get rid of what we have in the present. And I made this machine that's outside. And I invited uh, the French people to come to the Pompidou Center with, with chairs, put them in a conveyor belt, and um, you'll see after that, uh, we'll do some here. Uh, turn them into cubes, and yes, I was aware of César, and I called the thing a cesarean operation. <laughs> and, uh, they, and I built a wall with all the cubes that the machine uh, produced. Uh, it was a very sort of, it, it, you wanted ruinism, you got ruinism. <laughs> um, and it was fun. And it was, and after the, 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 the exhibition ended, I learned that the Pompidou Center wanted to give it to uh, Louis Vuitton to use to get rid of fake bags. And I didn't like the idea. But, and and the, the people at the Pompidou Center were very sort of uh, difficult about it. Uh, Louis Vuitton was probably going to give them a lot of money. And I, I disturbed by not cooperating with it. I had a show in Milan, and one of the officials of the Pompidou Center was there, someone I got very friendly with later. Uh, I won't name names. And she said to me, look, if you don't want to sign this document now, you have to take the machine tomorrow. And I'm in Milan, what am I going to do? And then I hear a voice from the back, uh, I'll send the truck tomorrow and we'll collect it. That's Rolf. <laughs> that, uh, I mean, so this is our first, our first interaction. <laughs> and today it's a very special day because ever since uh, that day, well, the, the, I was sort of very privileged to have the first exhibition at the new Vitro Design Museum. And the machine was outside and I did a workshop that we'll talk about. And the exhibition went and to, to travel to different countries, and the machine went. And after that, it, would, it was resting for almost 30 years. And it was uh, restored. And today, this week was the first time that we saw it working again. Uh, I haven't seen it for a long time. I remembered it a lot bigger. <laughs> but it is, but I'm sure they didn't shrink it. <laughs> and uh, but it works. It works uh, beautifully. So that was another another way that Vitra was, you know, part of my life. And then also Rolf did the Vitra editions. Uh, the Vitra editions. Let's see. 
uh, Vitra those days didn't have to go every year to Milan to show a new a new piece because they had uh, they had winners. They didn't. They had. I don't have to tell you. Let me find. Let me find the well temperature. Here, here's the well temperature. Um, um, Rolf started the Vitra editions, and the, the the brief of it was to do things that have no commercial constraints, no commercial considerations, to do a piece of furniture for their own sake, whatever that means. And I uh, I came and visited uh, the factory here. Amazing, amazing place. I've never seen anything like it, like thousand people making chairs and uh, furniture and amazing machinery and like, you know, use whatever you want. I still was more impressed with the basement. In the basement they uh, had, uh, they tested chairs for destruction. So they tortured chairs and they, with lots of, with weights and they dragged them on the floor and uh, when you went there it was like the theater of cruelty <laughs> but amazing very fascinating I always dreamt of taking this room and show it to the public say the Milan furniture fair to, to, to show people what you know what it takes to to produce chairs <coughs> so I came back I came back to to London and I completely failed my mission, instead of taking advantage of all these facilities, this amazing machinery and technicians and possibilities that uh, Rolf showed me, I went and did something that I, uh, not only that I could do myself, I could do myself better than them. And uh, I remember buying, I had this idea of, of buying uh, tempered steel. Tempered steel is like uh, sprung steel, still without memory. Uh, and to do like a portrait of a club chair, almost like a Matisse with four lines and you can see the face. So like, oh, two arms, a seat and a back. And I bent them and fixed them with wing nuts to show you that it's reversible, that there's no welding, nothing is fixed. Uh, so this is here. The four, the four uh, patterns, and luckily, I made the first drawing. I cut them, made the first one in paper. Still have it in my studio. And then, yellow pages. There was no Google there, but you could. We found tempered steel, and uh, it arrived. We cut it. We welded it, and and there it was. I knew. It's going to be comfortable because there's no, whatever they tell you, it's not difficult to make a comfortable chair. And, you know, we know the angle, we know the back, we know the height, we know. Um, so I knew it's going to be more or less comfortable. But what the nice thing about this chair was that it was made of steel. People looked at it and hesitated before they dared sitting on it. Is it sharp? Is it going to support me? What's, you know? And um, I had videos of the first people that tried it, and they all had the same line as if someone has written and gave it to them to read. Actually, it's very comfortable. <laughs> Just sort of, maybe it's because it's English, and, and uh, actually, it's like, Actually, against expectations, it's so if you learn that it's really good to break expectations, and it's better to break expectations positively rather than negatively. It's terrible if something looks comfortable and it's not, but the other way around, it's a lot better. So, I mean, this is uh, in the studio, this is Michael pretending to, to hesitate before he sits on it. And actually, it's, it's, uh, it's very comfortable.
So this is the first piece that I did. Uh, I used to do studio pieces. This is the first piece, the first commission I had from a company to do anything. Um, so, any questions so far? Because I don't know what I'm going to talk about next. But I, 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 mean, I have a lot of things I can show you, and uh, and I can I can uh, take any subject. Like I can talk about crushing if you want, because we have a crushing machine outside. Uh, I can talk about let's see. I can talk about ping pong. Uh, I can talk about what. I'll talk about things that maybe relate to the things we have in the in exhibition because the exhibition here uh, relates to a very uh, specific time um, where I, again, a time that I didn't know what I was doing. I had no idea what and why I was... I did uh, this sketch that, by the way, I'm very happy it's in the Vitra collection <laughs> because I would have probably lost it and, uh, and Vitra are very good at keeping things. And, but this is, this is really the first chair of the volumes. I just thought, I'll, you know, what if I uh, just take pieces of metal and bend them and weld them and make like volume just out of the skin and, uh, and see what happens. I actually did all the things that you see in this, in this uh, sketch, except for this one. This one I've yet to do. Did we? Yeah, I mean, anyway. So, if you go to... And then you, the way you post-rationalize what you do is why should everything be refined and polished? Why can't it a sketch remain a sketch? And why can't we do it like just like action painting or like uh, more direct, less? This is because that's what we could do. We didn't know we didn't know how to do things polished. We are very bad craftspeople. We are not craftspeople. And when I came here to see the show that you're about to see, I, I saw the ugliest Big Easy I've ever seen in my life. And it, it is so ugly that it's delightful. I'm really happy to see it because this is genuine. It's like, it's... Uh, I, uh, I was just happy that, you know, we could do something and of metal, bend it, weld it, all the marks are there, and it's roughly okay. And, ooh, patinating. The patinating is ugly. Everything is terrible. <laughs> but it's delightfully terrible. And I'm, I'm, uh, I wish I had this piece, but you have it. <laughs> uh, but, so, whoops. So, but later, hang on. Uh, later, when we got better and better at what we're doing, this is a later uh, piece that is very uh, polished, very perfect. All you had to do is change, change the lyrics. If you explain what you did, why should everything be polished? You just say, oh, look, this is like jewelry. And this is like, uh, you know, just you do what you do and then you find ways of explaining it. <laughs> um, and post-rationalize it. Um, this is we were getting really good at, at doing things in, in steel and I never wanted to be a craftsman. I never saw myself as a, as a glass blower or as a metal worker. I used metal because it, it's a forgiving material. I mean like I don't know on oh, this piece here, there's one here. You simply take sheets of metal and you beat it to death till it admits I'm comfortable. I'm a chair and uh, and people around you take turns sitting and oh, the lower back should be a little higher. Okay, with a rubber hammer and until when everyone's happy it's finished. First one, you know, I didn't know what I was doing. Second one was trying to improve the first. Third one, already too knowing, 
you know, you're just repeating. So we did only six of them. One of them is here, and again, this is a piece I'm very jealous of Vitra. Anyway, so, uh, and they went to different places, to different countries, and for me it was a very uh, exciting moment when I had my retrospective at the Centre Pompidou, that all six of them got together. They've never met each other before, and they are siblings, they are sort of blood brothers, almost twins. And uh, anyway, so this is that, and da -da -da, the primitive ones, the perfect one, and this is the last piece we did in our studio in, in London, before I moved everything to, to Italy, because we didn't want to get better and better and better at producing steel, because I had other things I wanted to do, uh, but, this is the prototype for this one, the D sofa that was very refined, where a super piece of jewelry. And this is the prototype. Uh, I think, if I'm right, this prototype that I, I could fake it tomorrow, but I can't. It, I think it's the most, uh, it's the most uh, expensive the most money someone gave someone else for a piece of ours that we were hardly paid for. So Caroline's upset that I'm talking about... about yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, sorry, I forget that. It's, anyway, so it was made out of sort of leftovers and things, and it's one of those things that happen. I visited the, uh, the Big Easy many times uh, and you know this one was done for uh, an exhibition at Sotheby's. Sotheby's once a year have an exhibition called Beyond Limits in, a, in uh, Chatsworth Sculpture Park and I thought what if we just pretend that the chair is made out of little molecules and we just zoom into them and then it's, you know, it's cut the shape of a Big Easy. I mean, I could have taken any chair, but I decided to take the Big Easy. And I'll make two, one negative and one, I mean, they're identical, except one is negative and one is positive. Uh, there was a deadline for the photography for the exhibition. Hey, what happened? Um, there was a deadline for, for the photography, and we said to uh, Sotheby's, don't worry about photographs, we can do renders that are better than photographs. So this is a render in Chatsworth, and we, not only we were late for the catalog, we were late for the exhibition. Not by a day, not by a month, but by a whole year. <laughs> uh, and I'm really pleased because Sotheby's used this image for the invitation for the exhibition. <laughs> and isn't it some kind of a victory that an auction house uses something that doesn't exist? <laughs> to, anyway, so um, this is like, I really love this model because it is a very uh, accurate model that we do on our computers. Mm -hmm. The colors uh, to do with the sizes of the things and uh, and the layers and the order of making them. It wasn't not designed to be beautiful, but it is. And after we do it, the poor artisan have to work the whole year making it. And this is real. And it's called Even the Odd Balls, this piece. And this is a piece that Vitra should be jealous of us, because we have it, and you don't. <laughs> um, okay, uh, crushing. You know, I, I don't know how many of you know, but uh, I uh, did design the uh, design museum in uh, in Holon, outside Tel Aviv. Uh, the brief 
was, can you design us a museum that we'll be very happy to put on a postage stamp? Every city, every little city in the world was jealous of Bilbao, of, of the second best museum that Frank Gehry did. <laughs> and, and so, uh, oh, this is like, a, this is the first sketch of the museum. Cotton, <laughs> this is the first render, and normally with architecture, it's a, it's a journey of compromises and negotiation and cutting corners. And I have to say that the museum looks exactly like the render and we didn't have to compromise anything. And the reason is because I never believed that they're going to build it. <laughs> so, I didn't, so I didn't have to compromise and to make it more acceptable. The, the idea of the museum was to give it the iconic look from the outside by the envelope and have the envelope be the st structure, it's a museum without a single color, and let all the exhibition spaces um, be white cubes. So I think, I don't know he here, but in Bilbao, lots of artists have a problem with the magnificent architecture and their exhibitions. So here, there's the envelope, and there's the, the white cube galleries, and all the services and the circulation is between the envelope and, and the exhibition spaces. Um, I said that there's not, not a single column. I really like this film because it is plastering the belly. This belly is structural to avoid any column. And it all had to be plastered in one day for technical reasons, so to avoid cracks and things. And for me, I think Pina Bausch would be very happy with this, <laughs> with, a, with a stage that is curved. And, and it, that's exactly the distance of a, a man standing up and lifting. Um, So this is about a month before, before it was opened. And it has, it has a hierarchy of outdoor spaces. And there isn't an, a, a minute that you know I'm inside, I was outside now. It is, you just, there's no threshold. It is, uh, you, you flow in and there's basically one big, Oh, we have one. Hi, Adar. A refugee from this museum is here. Uh, she worked on on the show. That I'll show you in a second. Um, and uh, and the, it has like part of the envelope. The structure is creating a, a louver that that shades. It's a it's a place where nine months a year you don't need any protection from outdoors. So all the circulation is mainly outside as well as, uh, let me see, ooh. Uh, when EasyJet celebrated 15 years of the company, they, they did a poster with, with, uh, with uh, all the cities they fly to. So let's see, uh, Belgium got, got the, the Atomium, Paris got the Eiffel Tower, nothing interesting about Cyprus, so they have the map of Cyprus, London got a taxi, and Tel Aviv got the museum, whoops, but it's not even in Tel Aviv, it's a different city. <laughs> so uh, in the same way that the stones, the Rolling Stones, when they play, that they perform in a, in a city, they do a poster and t-shirts with the symbol of the city. Again, they miss the city, it's not Tel Aviv. <laughs> so, I was asked to, uh, they bugged me and I delayed it, to do uh, a, an exhibition in that gallery, uh, in that museum. And I didn't want to do another retrospective after the MoMA, Barbican and 
Pompidou Center, I wanted to do something else. So I did uh, a cloud, a cloud of a retros re retrospective, which meant uh, we live, I lived in an area that we moved from the real physical to, to the virtual, from real thing to computer, from hammers to computers. So I did a show called In Reverse. I did this sort of um, image, which is a toy, a squashed toy. Uh, and then I thought, you know, how I wanted to do it with real Fiat 500s. I have a history with, with Topolinos and 500s, but we don't have enough time to go into it. But I decided to do a show called it in reverse, in reverse, because it's taking, you know, one of the definitions of design is to, to uh, impose your will on a material through some processes to perform a function. And here I took something perfectly functional, three-dimensional, and turned it into a useless two-dimensional thing, just the opposite of what we normally do. Um, it was a big journey to find out how, to, how we can achieve it. Uh, and the Italian people we worked with said, ah, oh, we'll do it a la casa. I said, how? Oh. And I did this, this sketch and I said, what, you're going to do it like that? Little did I know that they tried. I haven't seen the, I haven't seen this when I did the, the sketch and and ah it, it didn't it wasn't quite what I wanted. <laughs> and uh, yeah, they put a very big machine, not good. And then they took it to they took it to. <laughs> That is not what I wanted. <laughs> and you see the number plate, me no, me no. It's a, no, no, it's not me. And I thought maybe Tarantino would be happy with it. <laughs> but, but not me, that's not what I wanted. And then we, we uh, you know, we had, we did the, we had designed the exhibition, but we still didn't know how, how we we're going to do it. Anyway, so we went to some shipbuilders in Groningen, and they have very, very, very big uh, 500 tons presses, and we built a plate uh, the size of the cars, and we bought all the cars from London from an Italian family called Proietti. When I told them what I want to do, they started crying. <laughs> And I said to them, look, look, look. And they were in my garage because I had a Fiat 5. I'm not destroying them. I'm immortalizing them. I'm saying like pressed flowers. And the pieces are called pressed flowers. <laughs> and from that moment, they joined me. And they, they helped me. And uh, they cleaned everything. Took to, you know, then they are, and they sent the daughter to do internship in the studio. And, uh, you know, they were part of the project. So we took all the, all the cars to, to Groningen to crush them. Each had the key inside the ignition. And, uh, you know, we started one by one. Uh, we, this is the plate we made. And there's the yellow one. Okay, so... Okay, this is just the weight of the plate before we uh, employ the uh, the big uh, thing, the big 500 tons. So. Very, very, very. And so that's 
That's the show on the left here. And let, I mean, that's the blue one. But it's all the same. I won't show you all the thing, but this is... I'm doing it faster. So da -da -da. And then, so that's, that's the pieces on the wall. Uh, the uh, guy that gave me the white car used to work for me and he became a very important gallerist in, in Scotland, the Modern Institute. When Toby saw this, he said, but my seats were red. <laughs> and I said to him, yes, but I wanted a black and white piece. <laughs> so the next thing, this is Toby's seats. So I, I, hi Ernest. So I, I swapped it. Um, the biggest problem was to decide which is the A side and which is the B side. <laughs> Normally it's very clear which is the... So, uh, I love, this is my favorite, the one with the underbelly. Uh, although it's, it's very square and it doesn't look like a Cinquecento. And so... This one used to belong to uh, an English uh, soap opera star, and it was pink, not an original Fiat color, terrible pink. So I said, no, no, I'm going to sandblast it, and it rusted on the way from London to, to Holland, and when it rusted, you could realize that the door was from a different period, because it rusted differently. But still, this is a, a, another favorite. Now, for the show, uh, Fiat generously lended me the original wooden buck that was made by Dante Giacosa, the designer of the Fiat. And uh, it was done before computers, before CNC machines, uh, with drawings made on drawing boards, and with templates, and with uh, chisels, and rasps, and sandpaper, a masterpiece. And this is more or less my age. I'm slightly older, I have to say, than this. But that not, wasn't my problem. My problem was, how could I have in my exhibition a piece that's more beautiful than anything I've done? <laughs> this is terrible. So I decided to, to make a competition to, to Dante Giacosa. By the way, in Turin, I met his, his uh, family, his children, very nice. And I, this, I made this piece, which called the Rodi Giacosa. So it is uh, made by rods, and one by one, it took uh, six people half a year to do, because you can only do one rod after you do the other. And it's done, wait, 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 it's done. I had to build uh, the lattice structure, which is a symbiosis between digital, because we had the model uh, of the Fiat, and it was laser cut digitally, very precisely. And these people just uh, did one road after the other, and the A side, which is this, is as beautiful as the B side, which is this. Um, every corner was sculpted. This is Valentino. <laughs> and I signed it with the Big Easy. And another thing that you don't know is that my name, Arad, means bronze. So there's a bronze rod there. That, is, uh, that, 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 was, that was my, my signature. And the nice thing is that this, ah, the, the B-side, inside, looks just like an Aborigine uh, painting. I mean, this is the dots, nothing to do with me. It's the way the welders weld, you know, the, the masters. I mean, we're going to, with all the digital age, we're going to, to lose them. We're going to lose them to CNC machines. I love CNC machines, but I also love artisans. This piece is a collaboration between the two. This is the B-side, I mean, as beautiful as the A-side. And uh, 
the nice thing that this piece is now owned by the owner of Fiat. Uh, and, ah, and then I, I looked at all the lattice that I made in, to make it, and I decided to put them all together, and I made a piece that was called Blame the Tools. In Vitra, we have Blame the Tools too, the, the chair in Corten, which is, uh, it's the same. And uh, this is in the Royal Academy. Bloom, uh, and it is made all in stainless steel, so it's a great outdoors piece. I think it will be fantastic in the camp of Vitra, Rolf. <laughs> yeah, it's a... Uh, uh, no, but... Does anyone want to make a gift to Vitra? <laughs> Look, how... I mean, it's, oh, the sun here, but anyway. So, that was the, the physical thing. The, the digital, the digital uh, part of the show was this. We did this in the studio. Um, can someone switch the sun off? <laughs> and ten years ago, we would be super happy with it. But now we got more and more greedy, and we we wanted to make it more realistic than this. So, we contacted a company that analyzes what happens to cars in accidents. And, whoops, sorry. I'll start again. Company that analyzes what happens to cars in accidents. And I said, look, I have to ask, this is the new Fiat, not, not the old one. I have to ask Fiat if I can uh, let you have the, uh, the files, because Fiat trusted me with the files of, of the car. And I said, it's okay, we have them, because we work for Fiat. They, they analyze uh, for Fiat what happens to cars in. So this is the canvas. Again, all the colors here have nothing to do with art or with aesthetics. They are just work colors. Then we took this to a company called uh, Framestore. Framestore is a, is, a, is a company in London. They make all the, uh, all the special effects for films like Harry Potter, Gravity, everything that looks real in films that you know that is not real is made by uh, Framestore. And they were super, super generous to us, we came and studied like what we should, just like with the real one, we had to study what we take out of the cars for the crushing. Here we just, we had every little nail here that we, in the files from Fiat, but we just did studies of what we could take out. And, you know, it's, uh, and then we ended up with this piece. Is the sound working? We need the sound. Sound? Actually, the sound is. I just. Uh, it's a song. It's called Papa Piccolino. And I gave it to a friend of mine, Dario Marinelli, who is an Oscar winning uh, music score writer. Uh, this song I used to sing with my daughters, taking them to school, but I said Fiat Topolino instead of Papa Topolino. Anyway, I don't know what I'm telling you, because it doesn't make sense. But uh, that was done by Framestore, and it's super, super, super realistic. The advantage of digital crushing is that it comes back to life. So, and okay, so in the show that I said it's a cloud of retrospective, this was the stuff that is uh, digitally assisted, not so much crafty, but crafty as well. Uh, this is a huge 
uh, I'd use 3D printed of a dropped, not, not squashed, but dropped. Uh, when I said dropped, I mean this. And you'll see that the computer knows that the door is made out of one spiral, so the door doesn't break. Uh, and then, this is the, the product of the, the video. It's about four hours long, this video, but I'll stop it. And the music, whoops, whoop! Yeah. I don't know what to do. Oh, yeah. Okay. Maybe there's some word that I say that... Uh, the, uh, the music is a viola caprice by my brother who's, who wrote it and plays it. And it's... It, it's a, has a different rhythm than the film, so next time it will be... I mean, they sort of... I don't know, too complicated to explain, but... I'll stop soon, when it, come, when it becomes a car again, I'll stop. So it's this, piece, this piece is called Let's Drop It, okay, because it's not crushed, it just dropped. Anyway, I'll, and then there, these are life-size uh, sketches and a mixture between my sketches and then we put the model of it and the reflection of the sketch. And anyway, the huge paintings, really big. When we did the show, the most difficult thing in the installation was bringing the glass that was like six meters by three meters, pieces of glass. And uh, actually the girl that was here that I said that worked on the show was part of this this is the show in on the in uh, in Torino in the Pinacoteca Agnelli. Oh, this uh, these things the one this is an interesting story. Someone did copies of our chairs, and he had the audacity to take it to the place where we work in Italy to us to repair them. So we confiscated them and, and we kept them for many years. We didn't know what to do with them. We called them the prisoners. And then when I loaded the cars to go to Holland to be crushed, I said, hey, let's crush the chairs. So they are, they are the, the flat chairs and the, they were bad copies because they used steel that was unnecessarily thick. And it was so difficult to crush, more than the, more than the cars, in the, same, in the same press. So that is, that is uh, the proud owner of this car, John Elkan. And, okay. Um, what shall I show you now? I'll show you some recent work, like... Um, Recently, we did a, a new ping pong table. Ah, no, before that, we talked about, I'll tell you what, something else because it's here. Um, this piece, it's called, uh, it's, it's called the log glider. It's one cedar tree uh, from Innsbruck. Slightly older than me, it's 100 years old. And we carved a uh, a seat, and I wanted to write something, and uh, I 
invented all sorts of sentences. I wasn't happy with any of them. Then at home I thought, I have a book in the shelf in the toilet called British Wit. I said, I'm going to the toilet, and I'm going to take this book, and I'm going to open it, and the very first sentence that I read will be it. I was never so lucky. The sentence is, have nothing in your, whole, in your house that you do not know to be useful or believe to be beautiful, by William Morris. But I thought that's too prescriptive for me. And I added, or love. So, in other words, don't listen to anyone's prescriptive commands. Do what you want. So, uh, so this was this, yeah. And now we talked about artisans and about uh, CNC, computer numeric control, and things like that. So this is the same tree, the, just the, the next piece uh, above it, where it starts splitting into, into two twins, into, into two branches. Whoops, where are you? Here. Um, there was no space, because it had a hole inside, to write the whole sentence. So I just called it Beautiful Useful Love. That was the name of it. And we, it is, was shown in a show in, in Geneva, in a gallery. And I wanted to show this video that I love of, of making, the, making the piece. And uh, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll wait till I can move it faster. So there's a a CNC, a five-axis milling machine. It's like a mechanical woodpecker. I wanted to show this, this video in the gallery, and my gallerist said to me, it is a wonderful video, but the last thing I want is my clients to see this film. I want them to imagine you with a chisel and a hammer. <laughs> and... and uh, but, hang on, so now it is my handwriting, but it is, and it is a woodpecker, but it's, it's mechanical. Amazing, you know, it's, it's a... The thing is that the more sophisticated the machine becomes, the less machine-like the product is. This is definitely my sloppy handwriting. That is not a machine, it's my hand. But the replication of it is done by this. But now, what you don't know about this piece is that it glides, it rocks. <laughs> Normally, uh, we, a lot of the stuff that you see in this exhibition here is that we do studio pieces, uh, like arty gallery pieces, and then we find a translation to, uh, industrial, to industrial pieces. This is reverse. This one, I did a piece for Moroso called uh, What's it called? The glider? Yeah. Uh, the glider. Because I wanted... I, I'm fed up with sofas and things. And I... Excuse me, but all these things with the seat and the back and the things and we do... Blah, blah, blah. I just like... Yes, very good, very useful, but... Can we have the sound? Or, no, we don't need the sound. I'll speak. I'm speaking there. Do the no, no, no. You see, I'm copying so you myself. To do something that is uh, not that. This is lump, just one lump. Why should I speak? If why bark and when you have a dog? I'm, I worked on it today with someone that's used to uh, sit back and arms, and it took time to to get him to understand that we have to deviate from it. But I 
didn't show you the main feature about this piece. It looks like a very solid, heavy piece, just a lump. But in contrast to the heavy appearance of it, look, it can also move like this. So after and that, it is like I thought it's not, it's not heavy glider. enough. I'll make it heavier, and then I look for the tree. Unlike the and normal porch gliders, they all have big. Okay, so after that, that was followed by this one. So first the industrial piece, and then the arty piece. Um, ah, the piece for Moroso is looks like that. So it's, I mean, I wanted to avoid the division between the seat, back. Right? It's like one piece, and it's sort of pressed in, and you don't have to take my word for it. It's the most comfortable th thing I've ever sat on. Uh, and uh, it is, I don't know. And the nice thing is the gradation of the fabric and anyway, so that's, that's that. Another thing that we recently did, I was asked to do a piece to celebrate 100 years of the theory of relativity of Einstein. And they asked me to do, the Einstein Foundation, to do a bust of Einstein, and then they'll give it to people like Obama to sign and to, uh, to decorate, and to, then to Barbara Streisand. Or, I don't know, and, uh, and I said, no, I mean, Einstein wasn't a cow you know, like the cow that everyone's... And I suggested to do a book. So this is this book that's called Genius. It has, it has 100 pages, and each one is written by uh, a visionary. The text is negative. It's, it's, uh, it's cut out. You don't see it here, but maybe you will. And look, it, uh, the pages are turning by gravity. And I don't like telling people, you know, this is 3D printed. <laughs> Who cares how something is made? What we care is, is it good? Is it interesting? Is it delightful? Uh, you don't get brownie points for the technology you used to make it. But this is 3D printed. It is one piece. There's no, connect, no connecting the pages. Actually, it was designed by the negative, it, designing the gaps between the pages. The letters are empty. And then we also printed one in the space station in, uh, because they have a 3D printing machine in, in the space station. But what cheered me up the most about this I met the astronaut who did it, and his name is Naguchi. How nice! <laughs> There's Israel there for some reason. <laughs> Albert is very happy about it. <laughs> There's the Gucci. <laughs> um, what shall I show you? I'll show you ping, the last ping pong table we did. Uh, this is an early piece. It's called the ping pong table. And this is at the Royal Academy uh, in the summer show, like. I don't know, six years ago. And the best thing, the best story about this is that Anthony Caro was the, the national sculptor of England before he died, shortly after he came to see this in the opening morning. And he comes to me and says, this is a marvelous sculpture. And I said, you, I said thank you, Sir Anthony. And he says to me, 
you should try and play ping pong on it. <laughs> and I thought, this is, this is it, you know, like all this discussion about design and art and sport equipment. Here, the, the, you know, the national sculptor comes and he sees the sculpture before he sees the ping pong table. And um, this is a show I did, it was first drawn with a show I did with, with my friend Francesco Clemente, the painter, in Bologna. Uh, he's a, he's a, also. <laughs> The fact that it has a belly, the ping pong table, slows the game down, so it makes for longer rallies. <laughs> uh, and uh, ah, this is a show that I had in Moscow, and they had the ping pong table, and I made a big mistake because Gary Tatinsian, the gallerist, thought that no one, now this is in Geneva, da 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 da, -da. Yeah, Gary Tatinsian thought that no one should allowed not only to play with it, also to breathe next to it. <laughs> and I said, I said to him, Gary, this is a ping pong table, and you have to... And I convinced him to let everyone play, and this was my biggest mistake, because he's such a good player. <laughs> and I, uh, I lost to him. Terribly. I should have left it like <laughs> but anyway, so anyway. So ooh, this is a I don't know if I should tell you the story, but I was I went to Madrid to play against Nadal. <laughs> Why are you laughing? Um, to play against Nadal uh, on this new ping pong table. This ping pong table is called Ten Layers. It's made out of ten layers of stone. And the first one was just bending one way. This is uh, concaved completely. So it is, uh, it slows the game even more also. And he, um, this is a, a fantastic uh, company uh, Concertino in, in uh, Almeria and for some reason Nadal is the ambassador of the company I think for some re I think financial reason but uh, is, is the oops um, so it's not made of circles the circles appear as a topography like some pieces we did I think Ernest are you here Ernest? is Ernest here? Yeah, this is something that Ernest Moorman uh, did. So the idea is a continuation of this, which is, this is another, another story that uh, it's made of Korean. And it's, uh, I was asked by uh, Dipont, the producer of Korean, to do a piece for them for Milan. And they were so proud that the glue that you use to bond together slabs of Korean is uh, made of Korean. And they showed me a block and said, you can't even see where the seams are. And I was so proud of it that I immediately thought, I want to see the seams. <laughs> so, and the seams, the, this thing is about the seams. I said, can we use like black glue and red? <coughs> and so the, uh, the ping pong table is more or less the same topography, but it's not about the glue, it's about uh, about the layer of different color stone. Uh, I was very jealous of these two guys, the people in Almeria, they just finished making it. And, <laughs> and they played before me. Okay, I mean... Uh, so I went to Madrid and uh, Nadal had a tennis match in the Madrid Open, after which we're going to play. And it was the first time he lost the game in, after 50 games. So he packed his records and disappeared. I call it a technical victory. <laughs> like that. 
But anyway, but I played it, uh, uh, anyway, I won't. Um, how much, I mean, I can, we can be here for, what do you want to see? <laughs> um, let me show you. Sorry? We have to leave. Oh, we have to leave. Yeah. I'll show you. <laughs> I'll show you a piece that I think will be uh, Daniel image. Shall we see what Daniel sent me? <laughs> Once. Okay. Yeah, I mean, this is my friend Daniel. He saw a play. I don't know more about it than you. Pleasure sharing it with you. Uh, okay. This is a piece that is now, I don't know how to say the name of, of the city in, what's the name of the city in Holland? The, the Europe cultural, sorry? No, no, it's near Groningen. What's, what's the name of the city, Ernest? Say it again? Exactly. <laughs> so this piece is there now, but it was done, ah, Ernest is this for Frank Stella. Uh, and this is a piece that I did for the, for the Royal Academy, for the court. Every year, a different artist gets the court for the summer show. Uh, this is Kapoor, and this is Damian Hirst, and this is Jeff Koons, uh, Kiefer, uh, and two years ago, I did this one. It's called The Spire. <laughs> it, has, it has a camera at the tip of it and a screen. And you can see in the screen what the uh, what the the sculpture sees. Uh, Google, I called it spire, which is a pun in English between a spy. Spire is this shape of the top of a church. Google were very happy to sponsor it, and then they realized <laughs> that the name is spire. And I have a letter from them saying we cannot support a piece that is called spire. Because we're accused of spying. I said to them, I'll change the name. <laughs> but uh, they said, no, it's too big brother for us. Too, uh, anyway, so, so this is, it is uh, a piece that, I mean, the whole secret here is that the, the cuts, the sections are circular and they're slanted, which means that the cone is oval. So it's always continuous. So uh, this is made by the same people that crushed the cars in Kronigan. I hope I pronounce it okay. And, and uh, although inside the mechanism is like a Swiss clock. But uh, da -da -da -da. wait, where, can, where is it? Let's see. That is, what I showed you before was rendered, but this is real. And uh, I think this will be fantastic in the Vitra camp. <laughs> <laughs> and I think, uh, because it has, it has a, and it's not that expensive. <laughs> and it has, it has a camera that can be connected to your website. So you can be in Australia and look in your phone and see the Vitra house, the fire, to the, you can see the whole, yeah, I mean, I, I'm serious. And it's, and it's Dutch, it's made amazingly by these amazing uh, ex-shipbuilders. This is a speeded up, don't, this is, I'm sorry about that. I'll show you another piece that they did, and maybe it, we can go after that. It's a piece that's called Totot, which is, Train of thoughts of trains. Every year, uh, a different. Uh, they give, they give the um, Saint Pancras station, like the the terminal of Eurostar, to a different uh, artist, to do a suspended sculpture, and that is the brief suspended sculpture. That's where you have to suspend. I'll, I'll skip the thing. Wait, wait. I, Sometimes when I skip, okay. So this is by the them shipbuilders, and this is I'm looking at this. It is engineered amazingly and made amazingly. 
And it was brought to London by the Dutch and was handed over to the, Brit, the British installer on the night where England voted to leave Europe, on, on the night of Brexit. And there's, a, there's a, a, a wall there, a glass wall, that is actually the border. And uh, it was sort of very... I'm still in Holland here. Um, amazing job. What, what it was, it was about the illusion of something moving from one place to the other, but it stays in the same place, like the London train station, train system. They don't move. And there's a lot of problems with it. Anyway, this one. Um, so, um, hang on, let me. So it was a very exciting time. And it is going to be hung now. My problem on nights like that, where everyone is busy knowing what they're doing, I don't have a lot of work to do. I just have to watch that, and maybe take film. And I'm always more interested in the crane than in my piece. I mean, I'm very jealous of this amazing cherry picker. Um, anyway, so four o'clock in the morning, it started working, and there was a woman uh, with a broom sweeping the floor there. She didn't know me, but she says to me, I love it. Four hours later, in the opening, my friend Anthony Gomley, the sculptor, says to me, I love it. So I knew that I covered the whole scope. Of the... <laughs> so, anyway, I can't think of a good place in Vitra for this. <laughs> anyway.